Hi, I'm Sue Stockdale, host of the Access to Inspiration podcast, where we hope that you will be inspired by people who may be unlike you. I hope that their stories and insights cause you to reflect on the world just a little bit differently. And I'm excited today to record our 100th episode. And our guest is a multi-talented musician, educator and composer, Simeon Wood. I first met Simeon about 10 years ago when he entertained audiences on a cruise ship that I was on. And his music is inspiring. He's kindly given us a recording of one of his tracks from his latest album, Feeling Good. And you'll be able to hear it at the end of our interview. Welcome, Simeon. Thanks, Sue, and a delight to see you again after so long. Yes, we are speaking here whilst en route to Antarctica, and we're actually in the Drake Passage today on board a ship. So if you do hear any background noises, listener, then I do apologise, it might be an iceberg sailing by (gasps) or some other thing on our ship. (laughs) <laughs> That's the reality of life on board ship, isn't it, Simeon? It is. It is a delight and a wonder. It's a wonder <laughs> that we get through anything without disruption. And somebody might ask a question of you, Simeon. What is a guy like you, with all of these talents, doing on board a cruise ship in the first place? Well, all cruise ships, well, most cruise ships have a guest entertainer on board. And I've been a guest entertainer the last 30 years on various cruise lines. About 30 years of travelling the seas and entertaining folks with my music. Now, I've seen your show, which is absolutely amazing because you play quite a myriad of different instruments. So tell a listener about what instruments you do play. Well, the one I'm perhaps most famous for is playing the flute. But once I got to a certain level on the flute, I started to diversify with other instruments that your listeners would know. Whistles, penny whistles, Celtic whistles, the recorder, the saxophone, the clarinet. And then I started learning a few more unusual instruments and objects. I could tell you about the different objects if you like. Well, let's just dive straight in there. Okay, so the first object that or instrument that I kind of invented was the walking stick flute. So I took an NHS walking stick and I fashioned it into a flute. So it looks exactly like a walking stick and you can use it as a walking stick, but you can also play it as a flute. So that brings a visual element very much and a humorous element into the show. And then my other great fun one is the bicycle pump. The old-fashioned long black plastic bicycle pump with the fabric pipe tube at the end that feeds the air into the tyre. And I use that to create music. I wouldn't say beautiful music, but but it is, it's a laugh, yeah. <laughs> and whilst you're talking here, Simeon, you're really illustrating that sense of humour that you have. Why do you think that's important to bring that to your music as well? Oh, I think it communicates. I think humour breaks down a lot of barriers, as does music. It speaks to people in different ways. It makes people relax and and it creates a bond between you and the audience. And let's face it, when you're working on stage, it isn't you and the audience. It's you together with the audience. They're two very much part and parcel of a show. You can't have one without the other. And it's important that you understand that as an entertainer, that you're not just performing at people, but you're performing with people. And I'm wondering when in your career, when did you learn that lesson? Because I'm imagining as a youngster, when you started out with the flute and then graduated on to actually performing was that always how you viewed things yeah it started as performing at and being nervous to get the right notes in the right order more common wise would say and i think it was a very gradual process of understanding and seeing and watching people and understanding how they communicated with an audience and it's not just about playing the right notes in the right order and it's not just about playing a particular interpretation but it's about putting yourself into the music and having that integrity and that realness in front of people. And I first understood it, one would have thought through James Galway, fellow flautist of some some (laughs) note, but it was really a chance meeting of wanting to see a flautist called Eugenie Zuckerman. I was studying at Trinity College at the time in London and we were given free tickets, which always inspires a Yorkshireman to go ahead (laughs) to the show. And so I went with other friends to watch the show, all really to focus my attention on Eugenie Zuckerman, the flautist. However, when I got there, the other two accompanying her, it was a double bass player and a piano player. 
And right from the start, my eyes were glued on the double bass player, a man called Gary Carr. And he lived the music. Every fibre of his being moved to the music. His expressions, his facial expressions married so well with what he was playing. And that communicated as much as the audio. And I thought, that is what I want to do. That is the kind of player that I want to be, is to be able to communicate through every expression, through every feeling, through the laughter, through the smiles, through the movement, everything. That is a consummate musician for me, and it engages with and communicates to every audience. And how did, therefore, did you begin to develop your style for yourself to be able to, yeah. if you like, match what you saw? Yeah, well, for every musician listening to this, wherever you are on the scale of musicianship, find music that speaks to you. Play music that you understand and that you want to communicate to somebody else. That is the best way to engage with any audience. It's playing music that you want to play and you will enjoy it. And that enjoyment, even if they don't like the music, that enjoyment will come across to an audience. So that is a great piece of advice for anybody out there, wherever you are in your musical career. So where did that career start for young Simeon? (laughs) <laughs> when did you learn the flute or begin to have an interest in music? Yeah, well, like a lot of children in the 60s and 70s, I learned, I started learning the recorder. It was the ukulele of its day. Ukulele seems to be the most popular instrument for children to start on because it's small, it's easy to manipulate. And you can quite instantly play a beautiful sound on a ukulele. The recorder, not so. You do need a little bit more guidance with the recorder. But I started playing the recorder at school. We all had lessons. That was just part and parcel of the system in those days. And whilst I was at primary school, the age of six, a wind quintet came into my school to entertain us and to educate us. And... The horseshoe of the wind quintet, you've got the French horn, bassoon, clarinet, oboe, and then the flute player is on one of the ends of the horseshoe and leads the other four. And so I was very close to the flute player and I'd never seen a flute before. This was before James Galway made it a popular instrument. And I was entranced by the way it moved, the way it sounded, the things that he was playing, just the way that he was able to manipulate the keys and the flow of the music. And even at at six, it was magical. It was a magical moment. And I knew that I wanted to be, or I wanted to play the flute. I didn't know I wanted to be a flautist, but I knew I wanted to be able to play the flute like that. And so it took a few years to persuade my parents, cautious parents they were, and they saved the money up to buy me a new flute, 20 pounds. It was a long time ago. And they saved the money up, bought me a flute and got me lessons. And that was the very start. And if I could go on and tell you, my flute teacher, who I had then for the next three and a half years, and I look back now and it was the most important relationship I ever had at that age. He was not just a great flute player, he was also a great teacher, and the two don't always go together in music. You can either be one or the other, but he was both. He was only 19. Wow. But he was a wonderful guide as well, not just in music, but in life in general. And I just so wanted to do my very best every single lesson. I wanted to make him happy with my playing. And so that was the inspiration that he gave me. And he nurtured my playing and guided me forward for those three and a half years. Then he left and then I didn't see him again. There is an end to the story, which I might tell you towards the end of the podcast. Oh, wonderful. So sounds like that mentor, that guidance was inspiring in of itself. Yeah, and still is. I still look back on that time. I've still got the lessons that he gave me back in 1971. I think he was January 72, so I'd still only be eight years old. So do the maths, listener. (laughs) And yeah, I can see the lesson as I look through his handwriting. And yeah, it was just a meticulous guy and wonderful nature. Yeah. So from that early start and learning the instrument, Mm. how did you then develop it as a career? Well, during lessons, so from eight onwards, my hometown of Huddersfield, where I still live, is a very musical town. 
I'm sure a lot of people say their town is musical, but the number of choirs and orchestras and brass bands, there were six youth orchestras for children. Wow. In, That's a lot. in my town, yeah. <laughs> and you you grew through them and you were nurtured through them. So from the age of nine until I was 18, I played in the six orchestras, the six orchestras all together. I played in the orchestras and then went off to music college. But I still wasn't a performer at that time. I was very nervous about playing in public. And I remember having a master class with a lady the late now Tara Bentovim, who again, another great inspiring character in the music world, not just as a flute player, but in music in general. And I was petrified, absolutely petrified. And it was the days of flared trousers when they were out for the first time, by the way, any young ones listening. <laughs> and I remember thinking that I just felt like a yacht on the water. My Flake trousers were flapping so much because of the nerves. And I got through it. And every time I played in front of people, the nerves just, they competed with that desire to play and, and it spoilt it. I could only focus on how nervous I was and what people must think. So how did you overcome that nervousness? Well, it's probably been said before, but preparation is absolutely key. And if you're going to bookmark any part of this podcast, this is the bit you need to bookmark. I had a teacher that said the difference between a professional and an amateur is that the amateur will practice something until they get it right. A professional will practice something until they can't get it wrong. That's a very important <laughs> I hope that makes some sense. So you practice to the extent that it is impossible for things to go wrong. And then you tend to relax so much more and you can enjoy it. And when you enjoy it and relax, so do the audience. And if they're relaxed, you're even more relaxed. <laughs> and it just makes for a, a much better performance. So practice, practice, practice. Practice, practice, practice and constant playing in front of people. Yeah. And bizarrely, the smaller the number, the harder it is. What do you think makes the difference then? Why do you think? I think... The most I've ever played in front of is 20,000 people, okay? And this was at a thing called Car Fest that Chris Evans used to run. I don't know if that's still going now. And I played to 20,000 people and they were completely anonymous. I couldn't see any of their faces. They were so distant. There were so many of them. And I think that's what, probably what makes the difference. If there are a fewer number, you generally can see every one of them and feel their reaction. If there are 20,000, you don't. So it makes it a little bit more nerve-wracking. So we've been talking about the evolution of your playing and then going into performing. Mm. What about composition then? Because I know you've written a lot of music and you've produced a lot yeah. of albums. How did you then evolve into that? I, and this is a bit you don't bookmark, listener, okay. So <laughs> the first time I wrote anything, it was a Christmas carol and it was a Christmas carol competition. And there was a prize of a £2.50 WH Smith voucher. And that was the inspiration for me to write my very first piece of music. So it was monetary. It was financial. So, yeah, that's what inspired me to write. And it was because I won that competition. If I hadn't won it, I may not have written again. But someone saw something in my writing. And so I thought, well, if they believe in me, then I should as well. And I carried on composing after that. And the other reason was later on, I was gathering all these instruments, so the panpipes and caners and lots of South American instruments, passionate about their music of that great continent. And I wasn't being able to find any music. So I would write music that was appropriate, one, for my skill level on those instruments, and two, to play music in a style that a Western audience would enjoy. Because playing South American music in Huddersfield, it isn't quite the same as playing it in South America. So you have to westernise some of these sounds. There was a great group called Incantation, made up of Westerners, professional classical players, a lot of them, from Bally Rambert. And they played South American music in a Western style for the Western market. What you're reminding me of is one of the previous guests that we had on the podcast, episode 35. We spoke to Chris Tolley, who was a composer. And one of the things that he 
reflected upon was how important the environment was for him. He lives in East Lothian in Scotland and every day he can see nature all around him and that inspires his composing, it informs mm. him. Mm. So where do you get your inspiration from to think, I want to sit there and write something? People give me a lot of inspiration. Kindness of people, the emotions that I see in people's faces, that kind of thing. That inspires me to write because I kind of want to capture it. There was a great French composer called Sanson. And Sanson wrote a collection of works called The Carnival of the Animals. And in it, he wanted to capture the personality of the animals that he remembered seeing at the Paris Zoo. And that, for me, is what music's about. It's capturing a story, it's capturing a moment, it's capturing emotion, capturing a place like Chris Tolley was it. And I think that's important to tell a story with the music and not necessarily just create sound, a soundscape, but to create a story to go with it. So people are very important and many people have given me reason to write music, and either through their kindness or through seeing different emotions on their face or experiences that I've had. And one that comes to mind because we're in South America was flying into Punta Arenas for the very first time and I felt as though I travelled to the end of the world. I've been to Australia and New Zealand many times, but Punta Arenas, it just seemed, when I came out of the airport and looked around, I just thought I'd reached the end of the world. There is nothing it, much there. There's nothing much <laughs> there, and you feel as though maybe you took another step and you'd fall off the edge of it. It's a strange experience, and it's also a very, very long, arduous journey from Huddersfield. So, not that I walked, but I took the plane, but it's still very, <laughs> very, very difficult. And I was the very last one out of the airport because of very to checks. When I got there, there was just one taxi driver left. I had no money, one, because I'm a Yorkshireman, and two, <laughs> at that time, I wasn't that very well traveled. And this taxi driver took pity on me and he took me the, I don't know, what is it, 15 kilometres from the airport to Punta Arenas, free of charge, booked me into a hotel. And I thought, how kind of that man who had no idea who I was. And he had, you know, very little in the way of money. And so, and I just thought that was, that was so generous of spirit. So I wanted to capture that moment in a piece and I wrote a piece of music with a very tacky title called Warm in Chile because he was very warm-hearted and we were in Chile. And uh, so I wrote that piece and every time I hear it, I see him. I mean, I'll never meet him again, but I just see that moment. It was a very personal reason for writing that. And listener, on this particular travel that Simeon's on, Simeon's suitcase didn't arrive, but Simeon did. So I'm envisaging now... Composing a piece of music called The Lost Trousers yeah, or something the like lost that. Trousers. Yeah. <laughs> The Lost Trousers. The Lost Trousers, The Lost, uh, yeah, everything. Oh my goodness, it is a nightmare travel sometimes. But yes, so people inspire me and uh, situations. And of course, the beauty of this world inspires me as well. Yeah, it really does. So given that you've done a lot of travel because mm. you've been, I know, working and performing on, on cruise ships around the world for almost 30 years now. Yeah. What challenges have you faced? When hasn't it worked out? What would you say have been some of the obstacles or challenges along the way? Well, this isn't a particularly fair account, but quite often when you're traveling, you're working with people you've never met before. You're working with people you've never met and within quite a confined environment and you've got very little time and space in order to put the show together. And that for me is very much out of my comfort zone. And I think it's because I'm not in control of all the other aspects, the lighting, the sound, stage management. I'm not in charge of where my luggage is for example, this particular trip. So I do struggle with that because back home I'm self-contained. So when I come out to a ship, it is one of the difficulties that I have to overcome. And I do have to surrender a lot of that control and just give it up and mm -hmm. say, well, you know, someone else who knows better than me knows how the desk works, how the lighting works. They have to do their thing. That's what they paid for. That's what they're good at. Just leave it to them. And generally it does work out. But when it doesn't, I then lose the vocabulary to try and make that work again. So that for me is the big struggle. Yeah. So you're not just performing solo you are actually part of a team that is the production around you yeah and i have to say i am not a team player i was told probably about 20 years ago you're either a team player or you're not a team player and you generally know this in your late teens early 20s well 
looking back now, I knew when I was 20, I wasn't a team player. I opted out of orchestral work. I love orchestral music, but playing in such a big team, being directed by one person, I did struggle with. Now, one of the things that I've certainly noticed in the world of music is that creativity seems in a way sometimes to be getting more and more removed as music becomes a bit more formulaic very often. Yeah. I'm wondering, what would you agree with me? Or would you recognise that in a different way? I'd agree because my son is taking GCSE music as it's now, they call it now. And I would say it's very formulaic. And I get why it's formulaic in the way that they teach it, in the way that they have to take their exams. Because music, all creativity is subjective. A piece of art to you could be beautiful. To me, I just won't understand it. And the same with music to our ear. Maybe that's something to do with the way we brought up and the kind of music that is played in our home. But the way that it's taught at the moment is that you, for example, my son is writing a piece of music for flute and piano. And he has to have so many bars of a scale passage, that scale passage inverted, and then that scale passage, a variation upon that. Now, that for me has already ruined creativity, but I get why they do it. Because how do you mark something that can be so subjective unless there is guidance? But once you've done that, a little bit like taking your driving test, you practice so you pass your driving test. <laughs> and then once you've passed your driving test, that whole 10 to 2 mirror signal manoeuvre seems to go out of the window, doesn't it? And we drive with one hand on the steering wheel, a cup of coffee... Maybe we don't listen. A <laughs> cup of coffee in the other. And it's the same with music. You know, once you've learned the basics, hopefully then you're free to fly. Yeah. So I would say that there is a lot of creativity and people are breaking through the, maybe the constraints. But this is society in general, isn't it? The different styles of music that come along tend to be breaking free of the previous chains of a particular type of music or creativity mm, absolutely that's where innovation comes from yeah sure it? sure now you brought the subject around to schools mm. and i know you're now going into schools I with am. a project yeah. so what does that involve so i think it's because i was inspired by someone coming into my school i want to give that back so i go into primary schools not senior schools i have gone into senior schools but i, I tend to find a little bit of a wall but with primary schools i don't so four-year-olds to 11-year-olds is ideal for me. And I take a presentation called The Flute Emporium, which is a show of about 40 minutes. And I play the different instruments that I've gathered around the world and also made. Some of the silly ones like the bicycle bump and the crutch and I've got a thing called an udderbot which isn't my invention. I saw this guy on YouTube who'd made one and it's a glass bottle beer bottle, any glass bottle will do, with the bottom sawn off, and then to the bottom you strap a rubber glove that hangs loose down. Then you fill the rubber glove with water from the top of the bottle and blow across the bottle. <laughs> so it produces one note. In order to change the note higher, you squeeze the rubber glove, which is the udder, and the water rises in the bottle and therefore creates a different note. To lower the note, you release your grip on the udder and the water falls. It's not an exact science, but that's what makes it so funny because you don't ever quite hit the note. <laughs> <laughs> and the kids love that, particularly when the water comes out of the other, of the <laughs> neck of the bottle. So I take that into schools and it's really to inspire children not to take up the flute necessarily, but to think about having music in their lives to listen to live music, to see live music. That's also important. And maybe to think about being part of a music group, a choir or an orchestra, or if they are playing an instrument already, to inspire them and motivate them to carry on. That's also important. As I found with Gary Carr, the double bass player, it doesn't matter what instrument it is. If the inspiration is there, then you will be inspired. Yeah, for sure. That sounds like a wonderful opportunity for young children to, to learn and be inspired from you, Simeon. And I would say the teachers as well get a lot from it. Yeah, the staff 
do too. So they learn and then they understand and then they take what they've seen into the classroom. I've got a worksheet that they use in order. They can write like a little critique of the show. They can design an outfit for me. <laughs> some, of, some of them, they're all crowned, of course, and they're hilarious and lovely and very sweet. Or they can design a, a new album cover for me. And there's word searches and lots of things that they can do, some games that they can do as well. So, yeah, I, I love doing it because I see it's instant. I see the response instantly and yeah. the wow factor is fantastic. A different type of audience to perform with. Oh, de- oh yeah. De- oh, yes. Gosh, one lad. It was four years old. It was, it was just sat there cross-legged and it was just really intently watching. And then I played the bicycle pump and at the end... Now, you listeners won't be able to see this, but he put his head in his hands, just like my mum would have done when I was six years old, like in despair, like what possessed you to play the bicycle pump, which really amused me. Just It just looked like an older person looking at his child and going, I just give up. <laughs> Very funny. I love these stories that you're sharing with us, Damien. And I know that you introduced something in the virtual context that you're calling Live in the Lounge. Was that, yes. was that brought on by lockdown? It was. I very quickly, I tooled up technically in order to be able to film live shows. Generally, it started off on Facebook. It then went on to YouTube for a larger audience. And it was all about, at that time, it was all about bringing people together. Because even if we were just 100 yards away from our family, we couldn't go and visit. So... I came up with this idea of performing concerts that families, not just 100 yards away, but from all over the world, could tune into at any one particular time and be together. And so they were watching the same show and they were able to comment and text one another as the show was going along. So it brought families together. The other nice thing was that I could do shout outs to knowing who was watching. So I could say, Auntie Lillian in South Africa, your niece, nephew, send their love from Manchester. So it really did bring people together and it was a feel good factor. And I think with all everything that I do, whether I'm playing for a WI or playing in prisons or a hospice or a school, or on a cruise ship on the way to Antarctica. It's all about changing people and making a happier environment, changing that environment and making it a happier place, motivating people. Well, I really get that sense from the energy that you're introducing into your conversation with the passion that you have Mm. for music Mm. and for conveying the love that you have of it to your audience and to other people. You know, even though I've been talking a lot, I'm not a great communicator. I much prefer to communicate through music. And I think it speaks a different message to everybody. Words speak a particular message, but music speaks a different language and has very different meanings to different people, either because we attach memories to pieces of music. I could play What a Wonderful World to an audience like last night, and everybody will have a different memory of that piece, some sad and poignant some upsetting, but some celebratory. Some people have walked down the aisle to them. Some will have followed a coffin into a church with the same piece of music. So it means different things. And you play that music and that memory comes flooding back. And it doesn't matter how bad your memory is, that piece of music will bring something to the table. Mm. What do you think your legacy, if you like? Not that we want you to finish playing music now (laughs) and end, But as you advance in your career in the future and your life, what do you think you want your legacy to be to the world? Oh, Sue, that's that's hard. That's really hard. Without sounding to be too cheesy, I think I just want to make it a better place through music. Yeah. I want people to be happier and, and maybe take people away from some of the difficulties in life just for a moment. When I played in the prison just before lockdown, And I was a little bit scared of of playing in this particular prison. And I was doing a show to 400 men, which I hadn't realised that they paid to come and see the show. And various prices from £1 to £5 they paid. And the money was going towards instruments. And so inmates could learn musical instruments. So it was going for some good. And it was an austere environment. Even before I got into the prison, the number of doors to be locked and closed behind you before you got anywhere at all and then the wire and it was 
just very oppressive. But for that one and a half hours that I played, oh, and there was no interval because I was reminded that we can't take them all back to their cells and then bring them back. So it was an hour and a half. And I thought, how do I keep 400 men between the age of 18 and 90 from all walks of life? How do I keep them entertained for an hour and a half? But, you know, for that hour and a half, I changed that place. They weren't in prison anymore. And I I felt it was amazing for me as it was for them. I I just couldn't believe it. It just changed, not just the dining hall we were in, dining hall five. (laughs) It was was the whole... And I looked around at them and I saw the prison officers and everybody was so relaxed. And they forgot where they were, who they were. And I think that would be a wonderful legacy to have brought people out of difficult times, I think. And the same when I go into hospices and hospitals, it's changing people, allowing people to be removed from a difficult situation. Well, that's hugely powerful and inspiring as I'm listening to you, Simeon. I'm just thinking about your parents and that £20 investment. I'm sure they (laughs) think it was a very good deal. Yeah, they did. Especially my dad, because 20 years on from buying that flute, he sold it for £20. (laughs) Great Yorkshireman, my dad, and an accountant, yeah. Now, you mentioned at the start about your teacher who had had a significant impact on you, and how did that story end then? Right, the story ends by me desperately wanting to find him over the years and find out where he was and what he'd done with his musical career. And more than that, to thank him for that start. I wanted him to know what he'd done for me, for my life and my career. And uh, seven years ago now, I eventually found him quite by chance. He wasn't on social media and he wasn't called by the name that I knew him. But I found a picture and I thought, well, if that's not him, it's his dad. (laughs) And so I emailed him and said, if this is you, then read on. If it's not, just let me know. And he wrote back and said, yes, it was me and how lovely to hear what I'd done in my career. And he said, I'm still in France, still living in France because he'd gone over to study at the Paris Conservatoire. I'm still in France and I'm going to come over to England and we should meet up. And it was a very, very emotional meeting because I'd not seen him for 40 odd years. And... So we shared our stories. I told him what I'd done in the albums that I'd made and the other teachers that I had and what an inspiration that he was. And I said, what about you? And he said, well, he said, after getting that scholarship, I then bought myself a new flute and went out into the world and tried to be the flute player that you have become. However, after a few years of trying, I realised that I wasn't going to do it and I didn't have the support that I needed and I needed money. So in his words, he took on a proper job (laughs) and he worked in the oil industry and he put his flute away that day in its box, put the box in his sock drawer and it remained there for 45 years and he never touched it. And at that point... He delved into his bag, he pulled out his flute and he said, and this is the flute and I'd like you to have it. And he gave me the flute. And he said, flutes are beautiful objects, but they have a purpose. And that purpose is to be played. And the purpose of playing is to entertain people and to bring joy into their lives. And I want you to do that with this instrument. So he did. And I do. You must treasure that flute. I do. Yeah, that does not go in the hold of an airline (laughs) that will remain nameless. (laughs) It's been a real honour to speak to you today, Simeon, and and to get your story and feel your inspiration from how you're sharing your story. If our listener wants to find out more about you and your music and listen as well to some of those amazing tracks, how might they do that? So I have a website, which is simeonwood.com. 
www.ashleyhoop.co.uk. You can also find me on Facebook and LinkedIn and other social media platforms. And you can find my music on platforms like Spotify and Play and Google and Amazon Play. And you can download my music or listen to it, stream it, or you can buy the hard copy CDs. Anybody out there who's still got CD players in their cars or at home. And you can do that again through my website. So that would be lovely to hear from you. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much again for your time today. I hope that we continue to enjoy fair weather and calm seas on our trip to Antarctica. Same here. Thank you, Sue, very much. Well, I hope you enjoyed that conversation as much as I did. I think Simeon highlighted the ethos of this podcast when he shared the story about the flute teacher who said that each flute has a purpose and needs to be played to bring enjoyment to others. Isn't it just like that with people? Well, our aim has been to bring out the brilliance in our guests in these hundred episodes, and we hope that each conversation has brought enjoyment to you, the listener. I have an ask of you. If you like our podcasts, please share an episode with just one other person. That way, we will be able to inspire more people around the world. Remember to follow us whatever platform you're listening on, so you can listen to the next series as soon as it's published. And you can keep connected with us on social media. Finally, as a bonus from Simeon Wood, here is the title track from his latest album, Feeling Good, to give you more inspiration.